but it's, uh, I'm not going to have any of the omics in it actually. I'm just going to talk about bioinformatics and what it is. So, bioinformatics is one of these extremely flexible terms. It means something different to everybody who uses it. But often, in your grants, you will need a bioinformatics section because all the reviewers want to know that you've got somebody who can deal with the data. So bioinformatics is actually um, the intersect of a number of different disciplines. And uh, Angus has already spoken about that. It's mathematics, it's biology, it's informatics, not te uh, information technology, but informatics. Uh, it's computer science and most important for many things, it's also statistics. So, you will never find a single bioinformatician who covers all grounds on all uh, uh, disciplines, sub-disciplines within bioinformatics. Um, so, bioinformatics is also, there is this arrow here. Okay. We can define bioinformatics also in terms of pure and applied bioinformatics. And for most of you, you're probably not interested in pure bioinformatics, but that is where we devise new ways of analyzing things. Perhaps uh, new network analysis, like uh, fairly recently over the past number of years, uh, perturbation of network analysis, uh, networks to define which elements are potentially key and therefore could be causative in uh, downstream events, or uh, 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 coordinated genome, gene expression analysis in terms of uh, uh, networks. Also, new methods of analyzing RNA-seq data uh, using different mathematical models like a negative binomial to correct for certain aspects of, of count data. These are important to you eventually, but you're not really that interested. So mostly, we will be talking about applied bioinformatics. That's what Angus is telling you about mostly. Is, you know, that's what we do with the omics, with the pre-processing, and then you do some analysis and statistics. It's an analytical science. It's that's really what it is. It's an analytical science. And in any analytical science, already going back a number of years, there's this well-known acronym called GIGO. Garbage in, garbage out. And so this is very important and was recognized already, uh, I think, in 1850 by Mr. Babbage, who was asked on a number of occasions about his difference engine If you put into the machine the wrong figures, will the right answer come out? To which he answers, I'm not rightly able to apprehend the kind of confusion of ideas that provoke such a question. In other words, the data that we get uh, and the answers we get from that will only be as good as the data that come in. Therefore, in terms of your experiments and in terms of bioinformatics, the quality of the data is paramount, okay? Bioinformatician is not a magician. We can't make things happen if the data were no good. <coughs> um, okay, so for data, there are a number of different aspects of data quality. One is technological. It has to do with the instruments and the computational pipelines. But those are easily controlled. The ones that are less controllable by bioinformaticians are the non-technological ones. The guy at the bench, the guy collecting the data, and how they are trained, and whether they have procedures like standard operating procedures, and whether or not their certification. If you get your data analyzed by a core, they typically have a standard operating procedure. And so from the 
the moment it gets into the core, we know exactly how the data are generated, how they are processed, and that's good. But the process before that is what's going to determine whether or not the experiment is going to give you good answers or not. Um, okay, All right, so when you are collecting data, there are two major components that you want to pay attention to. One is data provenance, and the other one is data integrity. Provenance is who did what, when, where, and how. Okay? And if you don't have records of that, it makes it very difficult to actually come up with a good answer. Because often, as we were talking about batch effects, if you've recorded those things, we can kind of, hopefully, try and correct for them. If you haven't recorded that, I'm going to be making a guess that it's a batch effect, but I can't really do anything about it because I don't have the record to say that I should be doing something about it. Okay, data integrity is simply making sure that no unrecorded uh, changes occur in your data. I often get data handed to me for analysis that come in an Excel spreadsheet that has been handled by five people. Okay, you know that if you just sneeze while you're doing something with Excel, you could change the data. Right? So this is not a good way of ensuring data integrity. What I mean by that is that we usually try to make sure that we have files for which we can give a MD5 sum, which is sort of a checksum of the content, and that when it has been established, it, that content has not changed since the last <coughs> authorized use. Okay, so these are important considerations because there's a lot of bad science due to inadvertent changes <coughs> in data that we don't know about. So before you do your experiment, you want to consult your bioinformatician. I'd like this quote. To consult the statistician, bioinformatician, after an experiment is finished, is often merely to ask him to conduct a post-mortem. Uh, <laughs> this person, the bioinformatician or the statistician, will be able to tell you what you did wrong and why you can't get an answer. This is not really a good place to be. The person who uh, gave that quotation is Sir Ronald Fisher, and uh, I think it bears repeating often. So you want to consult your statistician before you get the data. So the bioinformatician's nightmare is this thing, sometimes not a nightmare, but most often it is. I have these data, can you analyze them? Okay. <laughs> And usually that means something that's the following one options. I did my experiment without consulting anybody. Can you give me a p-value less than 0.05? Okay. The other alternative is, please torture the data until it says something. Right? This is not a good place, not a good experimental design. It's not a good place to be. Occasionally we get good data. That's great. Most of the time, though, it also takes me oh, probably 80-90% of the time is getting the data from some dismal format that doesn't make any sense to something that I can actually analyze. Right? Reconciling all sorts of differences in the literature and various other things. <coughs> if you consult your bioinformatician beforehand, you'll be collecting better data that is more easily analyzed, and everybody will be a lot happier. All right, so that gets us to data management. You want to do a data definition at the beginning of your experiment. What do you expect to collect? What data will I be collecting? What, uh, in the data dictionary, what, I, what am I going to call things? Most often I get tube number 
sample ID, but that's also this, the individual ID, and that's also some other thing that's exactly the same. And I have to reconcile multiple files in which the naming is totally inconsistent. I have to make guesses or I have to consult all the time. So you want variable names that make sense. Usually, uh, I like what they call big Indian names. That's not big Indian, that's big end. It's a computer term that means that you put the most important aspect of something first, and then if there's some other component, you put the second most important, and the third most important, and so on. These are self-explanatory names. You don't have to have a lot of uh, knowledge about the system to actually be able to de derive what it means. You also want to know what kind of data that is going to be so that you don't get what is often a nightmare for a mathematician, some character-based thing mixed in with a number, right? Numbers should be together and characters should be in one thing. The other thing about Excel is that you can get away with spaces uh, which are characters mixed in with numbers and that creates an element of character. You also want to know what are your limits? What are you accepting in terms of data? Are there things that are out of range that shouldn't be in there, that are easily identifiable as out of range? If it's a, it's a class-based thing, you want to know what classes are permissible and use the same spelling for every class, the same uppercase, lowercase, because they are different. Anyone who uses a restricted vocabulary, you don't want every version of uh, an antigen being used in the experiment. Okay, um, yeah, this is common. Uh, all different versions of the same thing. Uh, I always like, rather than sample ID, I like the word specimen ID. Uh, it connotes also not only the sampling, but it connotes time uh, and every other aspect of it. And each one should be unique. That is, you don't use the same numbers for different aspects. Like if you create Aliquots, each aliquot should have its unique number. So you know which one was used and which one was bad. Or so. And if you're doing a multi-site project, you want to have the same naming used by all the projects, by all the sites of the project. Which again gets us to the, to the aspect of the data dictionary. So if you have a data dictionary if beforehand, then everything gets much easier. Now, with respect to experimental design, I want to talk about two things of, of replicants. They're called technical and biological replicants. If you do technical replicants, what you are actually looking at is your error of measurement. So if you do five things at the same time with a particular strain of bacteria, the five different tubes, those are not independent because they're being subjected to the same conditions identically throughout. They are your error of measurement. They don't tell you anything of the real in item of interest, which is the error of the process. That biological process or whatever process it is that you're studying, that's what you want to know. So it's better to have five different RNAs than to sequence five RNA, uh, the same RNA five times. Okay? Uh, if you have the money, you can, of course, do the error of measurement experiment. And that is useful to reduce the variance, because the variance can be divided into the biological variance and the error of measurement. And so you can get rid of the error of measurement if you know it. But it's not the main thing of interest that is usually very expensive. Okay. Let's get back to consulting your bioinformatician. Uh, usually this person should have a broad range of knowledge and uh, applicable, or if they're a team, they will be 
that knowledge available and you should make use of it. This person will usually know the platforms, the analytical approaches and the algorithms necessary for that and that can help you inform your experimental design. They're usually able to assist you with aspects of the data collection that I was talking to you about, both helping you with getting your data dictionary right and, and with the actual collection and management. They will know the analysis of what analysis you could propose for that experiment. It can help you make a design that is going to be fundable because they know the ins and outs of what can and cannot be done with those type of data. Very importantly, some <coughs> will be able to help you with power. Right? Power is almost always required for non, uh, for anything you, involving humans, anyway. Uh, and you want to know that you have the ability to detect the effect of interest, right? And power is sometimes really difficult to calculate. The easy one of, you know, are the means different for something is not that hard, but uh, for some of the platforms this requires a lot of thought. And they will be able to advise you about correction for multiple testing. Um, a pile of data, data set, has a finite amount of information. <coughs> and if you test every aspect of that finite amount of information, you are going to find every peculiarity in that data set. That peculiarity is not generalizable, right? So if we sample something, we can, on average, get most things to fall within the range of the, near the mean of the population. But there are going to be things that, just by chance, fall outside of that. And so, if you do all those tests, what you're essentially doing is you're exposing yourself to all these false positives. So this gives you... <coughs> This is sort of how we need to think about p-values as well. Recently, there, last year, there was a publication on p-values. So most of the time, if you take something and it's sort of nearly normally distributed, you can think of your p-values values also as these most likely observation. And if we have a threshold, then this we consider significant. But, it also depends on how much prior information we have, right? If we have no prior information that this process is real, then a 0.05 is rather meaningless. And I'll show you that in the next slide. Okay? So the prior odds here are, are 1 in 40, so uh, sort of close to having no information, and then if you've had some other experiments showing that this process is likely to be true, then it's 1 in 10, and if your prior odds are 1 in 5, then it's highly likely to be true. So this is the probability of false positives at um, thresholds. So essentially you expose yourself to a tremendous amount of false positive uh, uh, results if you use the wrong threshold and if you do multiple tests. The bioinformatician will also be able to give you uh, guidance about presentation of data. So today I saw, and yesterday I saw a large number of plunger plots. Uh, most statisticians frown on plunger plots because most of our data are not in fact normally distributed and same and putting in standard error on a bar does not capture the variability of the data. You must also consider that when you do things like pathway analysis, your data should be concordant with the whole pathway. It doesn't help if you have a few hotspots here and there and say, ah, this pathway is enriched, right? Because the rest of the pathway isn't there if it's not expressed. 
So you want to know that all the genes are expressed, or most of the relevant genes are expressed, in order for that pathway to actually be of interest. And if you have that, you can actually trace within the pathway that the pathway is activated or inhibited, as the case may be, and all the relevant gene expression is there, and it actually is a pathway of interest. Right? So pathway analysis isn't just something like, oh, yes, this cluster is enriched, uh, without thinking about the content of that pathway. Similarly, when you do uh, ontology, this was a chip uh, experiment. You can't just higgledy piggledy grab everything and just make a story. And we're excellent at telling stories. So, you know, you give me 20 genes and I'll concoct a story for you. Right? So, you really want to be disciplined about what information at what level of an ontology you're going to use to say there is concordant activation of those yellow boxes. So I just blew up a few of them so one can see that. Right, so this was a chip experiment in uh, human uh, tissue from uh, surgery tissue. And the process involves a lot of uh, uh, inflammation and we had selected a bunch of uh, uh, transcription factors based on the prior analysis of, of transcription data. And then we went back and looked at the genes that the chip for that transcription factor uh, found. And you can see that the leukocyte uh, T-cell activation regulation of lymphocytes and leukocytes is activated. So, in this case, we took a transcription experiment, did a chip based on that, and then showed that the same results that we got in the, in the transcription experiment were found back in the chip experiment. So, what I've been doing lately is, uh, as part of the uh, bioinformatics, is doing a lot of this predictive modeling. And this is what Gerhardt had shown us uh, yesterday. And here again, it's important to be, sh and as Gerhard had, had uh, emphasized, it's important that you take data, train on one data set, and test on another data set. Because if you overfit on your one data set, you're not going to be able to uh, apply the model on another data set. And that's called the variance bias trade-off. And graphically, we can explain the variance bias trade-off as whether you have bias here or there is irrelevant, is this sort of curve. And as you increase, as you decrease your variance, which is the most standard statistical methods are based on uh, reducing variance optimally. What that means is that the model tends to get highly precise uh, uh, predictions, but they're far away from the population truth. That's the distance between your, your precise prediction and the actual population truth is your bias. So when you build these models, you have to actually do it in a way that tries to get somewhere so that you're not either uh, have extremely low bias and lots of variance because then it's very inaccurate. But you also don't want to be the model so fit that you have a lot of bias. So th these are aspects of the bioinformatics that you have to think about when designing experiments. Um, I would like to return and my final slide to the central dogma. And I will present this because it is of interest, because it was, uh, present, uh, it was devised by Francis Crick, and it's appropriate that we go back to him. And this actually uh, about the transfer of sequential information in cells in biology. So this is how it's presented in most textbooks. 
But that is actually not what the model said. The model said, once information has passed into protein, it cannot get out of it. it didn't say it goes unidirectionally from DNA. And there's just another phrasing of it a few years later. What? That's the actual analysis that they showed in their paper of 1958. It says, we examine all states of, of transfer, and we exclude the ones for which we have no evidence. But we also know that RNA can go back into DNA through reverse transcriptase, and we know that there is some evidence for some DNA going to protein. Right, so this is actually one of the first bioinformatic analyses that was done. And it illustrates that it doesn't have to be tremendously technological, it doesn't have to be omics. A bioinformatics experiment, a good gedunk experiment, thought experiment, is often worth a lot more than a lot of omics experiments done poorly. Thank you.